Hey everyone, this is Brian from the Tennis IQ Podcast. Josh and I hope that you are enjoying the content and discussions that we put out week after week. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us to continue to produce quality episodes, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership. Currently, we have two tiers of support, $3 per month and $7 per month. So again, our Patreon page is patreon.com slash tennis IQ podcast slash membership. Thank you so much. And now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to the Tennis IQ Podcast. I'm Brian Lomax. And I'm Josh Berger. For today's episode, we're going to be discussing tennis as a fighting sport and tennis as a combat sport. And there's a book that we have mentioned on this podcast in the past. And I know, Brian, I think it's your favorite book or or right up there with one of your favorites, um, The The Fighter's Mind. And it's a book that I had wanted to read for a little while because of some of our discussions and because um, I think it it really is important um, for tennis players and all athletes to be able to learn from all different types of sports and all different types of, of athletes. And what what's nice about this book, and we'll dive into some of the specifics of certain chapters and certain themes um, where sort of in each chapter, um, Sam Sheridan, who is the author, talks about, you know, he sort of outlines a specific person or a couple people and dives deeper into that specific sport and that specific type of, you know, fighting or combat sport. Um, so yeah, but I think for, for this episode, we can, um, talk more about that, but yeah, in, in terms of sort of how I originally got interested in it, I think Brian, you know, from some of our discussions, both on and off the podcast about, you know, this book and also, you know, the, this concept that tennis really is a battle. Tennis really is, you know, one person against another or two people against another two people, but really it is a battle where most of the time you don't have a coach present. Most, you know, you, you never have the ability to just sub yourself out like you could in another sport. It's a matter of who is better on that particular day or which team is better on that particular day. And can you battle? Can you handle the emotions, the ups and downs, the maybe emotional roller coaster? And we can talk more about that, that concept. Um, but being able to handle all of these, all of the circumstances, all of the emotions, all of the, the fight that the opponent is bringing you as well. And I think this book does a lot to really outline that in, again, a number of different sports. And I think there's a lot of themes that that overlap with tennis as well. I think the first time I understood that tennis was a fighting sport was when reading a book by Bud Collins a long time ago called My Life with the Pros. And I may be not quoting this verbatim, but he said something to the effect of that tennis is basically boxing without bloodshed. And because it is that one-on-one piece. But what makes it so mentally challenging actually is the fact that it lacks the physical contact with the opponent. And so there, obviously there's no bloodshed. There's no necessarily, I'm not inflicting actual physical damage on you. So what ends up happening is that players, because we have that time between points, if you don't get that it's a fighting sport, you'll often begin fighting yourself. You begin judging yourself, which is something you would never do in an actual you know, sport in which there is physical contact. Because if you did that in, say, boxing, and you threw a punch and you missed, you wouldn't take the time to tell yourself that you're terrible. Like, how did you miss that? You would get knocked out. You just don't have the time to do that. So you you typically stay more engaged in those sports. Not necessarily, though. You know, I mean, there are obviously going to be breakdowns with with fighters, too. But um, you just simply don't have the time to judge yourself. And you, you know you're fighting somebody the entire time. Where in tennis, you can lose track of that. And that's why... Um, this book was so mind-opening for me. Um, I read it when it first came out, so I still have the hardcover copy. 
in 2010. And just going through each chapter, and I think you, you, you stated as well, Josh, you know, each one is really about a different person in a different fighting discipline. Actually, and there are a couple of people who are sort of outside that. Um, and you don't have to read them in order. There's no, there's no progression. You can actually pick out and read which ones you like. And we're obviously going to start off with a couple of chapters that we thought were really, really good. But this, the one thing that this really brought to me, Josh, was this idea of can I bring the level of intensity to a tennis match that I would have if I were actually in a physical fight? Um, can I can I step that up? Can I make the intensity more about fighting the opponent than fighting myself? And um, then I, was, you know, as I read that, I was like, then I started to apply some of the lessons that I was reading in the book back to past matches. Like, oh yeah, I guess I have experienced this, but I wasn't as aware of it. Yes, these things were happening that are talked about in the book, but again, I wasn't as aware. Then I started trying to make them happen, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, but from the perspective of understanding tennis better, this book is brilliant because it really focuses on that one-on-one -on -one piece, but also about how you can become better at what you do and understand yourself better, your sport better, your weapons, your strengths, and how to put all that together. And so I just thought the book, you know, if you do a really close reading of it and really are trying to not just learn about the people, but learn about the concepts, to learn about the character, to learn about, you know, the level of humility that many of these people have. You know, my my first impression of people in MMA wasn't necessarily positive. But after reading this book, I was like, wow, a lot of these people have like amazing character. You know, for whatever circumstances that they've had in their lives, they were driven to wherever they were driven to. But they have like amazing character and they're masters at what they do. And there's a lot of wisdom, I think, in this book that can help uh, help tennis players for sure. Totally, totally. And I, I, you know, I'm somebody that has relatively limited um, personal experience with, with uh, you know, with sort of combat sports other than tennis, I guess you could say, or, you know, sort of the traditional, um, you know, sports like a boxing or wrestling or, um, you know, I've done, I've done a little bit of Muay Thai, a little bit of mm. jujitsu, but it's, it's been, it's been limited. Um, but I, I, I'd say I also, you know, haven't always maybe appreciated the sports for what they are. I think sometimes I, you know, whether, whether it is the blood, right. We would, go back to that Bud Collins quote. And sometimes, you know, it is that bloodshed or it is that violence that, you know, I think gives off the impression that these sports are just kind of macho and okay, who's stronger? It's one person beating up the other person. But I think when you can dig a little bit deeper, and I think this book really, you know, helps people do that, it shows that there really is a lot of thought behind it. It really is about managing your emotions, being able to channel emotions as they arise, being able to manage yourself, being able to be aware of, of the opponent's strengths and weaknesses, starting to notice, you know, tells or, you know, what the opponent is going through. Um, one chapter in particular where they talked about Josh Waitskin, who um, I know was a, a junior chess champion, also a Tai Chi, I, I believe, world champion yeah. um he talks about tells right and being able to you know almost study the opponent and be able to see you know through their emotions through their body language tells about what's going on and obviously you know that that term tells is often brought up in poker right is you know somebody has like if they're playing um texas hold'em they have pocket aces and you know you see a certain type of emotion come over them and it's, and it can be visible, right? That it's sort of the classic tell, but he talks about this in, 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 in another setting. I remember he, he brought up a story of being in Bermuda with a, a ton of chess players, all staying in this resort, all, you know, playing chess and hanging out together and that these storms would come in 
and he described two different types of people when the when the storms would you know when everyone's on the beach and these storms would come in and he would watch to notice these two types of people one of the types of people is the type of person when the storm comes in they panic they run they you know they grabbing all their belongings they're grabbing the the beach umbrella whatever they brought out there their their picnic bag and they're they're running back to their room and the other person is has has a different type of mentality and is maybe a little bit slower to gather everything is maybe enjoying the rain or you know not panicking or scrambling in that moment um, and he talked about how, how based on how people handled those, that situation based on those those two different types of people he would approach playing them in chess differently he would for for one of them for the one that would you know that first type of person that would that was scrambling running around trying to get back as soon as possible he would try to make the chess game a little bit more chaotic and you know it's almost more of like a cat and mouse. We could sort of compare that to tennis, you know, keep things, keep the opponent guessing, I guess you could say. With the other person where they maybe are, um, can embrace that chaos a little bit more, he would try to make the situation a little bit more complex and try to make the person have to really calculate and think through different different variations that they might have to encounter and try to really make it a complex, difficult, challenging position that where they'd have to think, you know, many moves ahead. Um, so I think that was interesting. And I think that, that, you know, and I know now we're sort of diving a little bit into some of the chapters here, but I think that can definitely be applied in tennis and be able to really understand your opponent and maybe look for those tells. And maybe they show that off with their body language in terms of where they are at in that moment, in terms of their mindset, in terms of sort of their state of mind um, and being able to manipulate that or sabotage them using tactics that, that you have by really understanding their game and understanding what are the types of things that you need to do that will be successful and get to them. And it's it's not a one size fits all approach. Again, some types of players, maybe it is that cat and mouse, you know, drop shot lob type of game where you have to mix things up, have to make things difficult for them. Maybe for another type of player, it's the consistency that they struggle with. And that's the type of playing style that you need to embrace in order to really make things tough for them. Or it's putting pressure on them in another way, maybe by coming to net. But I like that story that he told because I think there's a lot of parallels there that by really understanding our opponents and how they handle different situations, we can better make decisions that um, to, to capitalize on their personality and on their their state of mind in that moment. Yeah, I would agree with that. As long as what you're trying to do is within your competency, right? Yep. Because everything you named, you have to be very good to be able to do all of that. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, and obviously Josh, in terms of his ability to play chess, could play both of those kinds of styles, and he was comfortable doing that. But, you know, I wouldn't suggest to somebody who doesn't, have good feel to all of a sudden start drop shotting and lobbing somebody. Um, you know, it's like, all right, how can you use what you're good at to pressure this person? Um, and so I think it is a good also recognition of like, okay, who are you as a player, as a fighter, what tools and strengths do you bring to the table? Um, because I do think there sometimes is a, this notion that you must be like a chameleon to all of your opponents. And I think that's not exactly right, especially as you get better. I think it's more about using your weapons in ways that take advantage of your opponent's weaknesses, right? Um, and Josh just happened to be very versatile with his chess game. And some of the people listening may be extremely versatile with their tennis games and maybe they can do serve volley chip and charge or be consistent and all of those things. But I would say that's not most of us, right? You know, I know like I'm not, yes, I can serve volley, but long-term that's, that's going to not work for me. Um, I need to kind of craft, I still need to understand the opponent and I still need to understand like, what are my leverage points and what I can exploit, but I've got to do it within the framework of my game um, to get there. 
What I like about the Josh Waitzkin chapter, I guess a couple things. One, he talks a lot about the idea of presence, which we have mentioned, and the idea of using your breath to bring mental clarity to what you're doing. Um, so that that's just a reinforcer of a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, Josh, with respect to breathing, um, whether it's you know rhythmic breathing, diaphragmic breathing, relaxation breathing, and just taking conscious control of that so that you can get your heart rate lower. Um, the other thing I really like about this is his notion of that, and this is actually the name of the chapter, I think, right? Everything is always on the line. Yep. That's the name of it. Yeah. And at first, you're kind of like wondering, well, what does that mean? Everything is always on the line. To me, it's like when you go to practice today, you want to make sure, or training or whatever, you want to make sure you get something out of this practice. You want to make sure that you're being purposeful and intentional in this practice because your future is on the line. Every, you know, your, your potential, you reaching that potential is on the line based on what you do. And if you just come out of a practice having just, I just need to get through the next couple hours, uh, you know, you've sacrificed a little something there. So you always want to recognize that when we talk about the best version of you being the person you can become, the player you can become, you want to be really intentional about going into training, practice matches, competition matches, with this attitude of what can I get out of this situation? What can I learn from this situation so that my game gets better? Um, And so that combines with this idea of presence because if you're more present – you will be more able to do those things. You'll be more able to um, be intentional and purposeful around uh, what you're trying to do. You know, what's the opposite of not being present is maybe thinking about what you have to do later or thinking about some things that happened earlier in the day. Um, And so bringing this back to, you know, a match situation, and I think we've talked about this, Josh, in past episodes, Great players at the later stages of the matches are, are, are present. It doesn't matter how they got to that big moment, you know, whether it's four all, five all in a third set or four all in a second set, they're able to be in that moment. It doesn't matter how we got there. If you blew a 4 0 lead, so what? It's 4 4. And that's what the best players can do. They can be present, they can use their breathing to be present. Now, In that moment, everything is on the line, isn't it? It's a crucial moment of the match. And for you to take advantage of it, you want to be present. So working on this idea of being more present, having a presence, using your breathing, um, this is important not only in tennis, but in in fighting skills and chess, anything that you're doing, the more that you have some clarity, mental clarity, um, the more you'll be able to take advantage of things and the more that you'll... um, be able to realize, hey, this 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 is on the line right now. This result, this outcome that I want, I it's within my grasp. If I can be present, I have a chance. Totally, totally, and it, and it's tough. It's it's tough to do, right? Yeah. And we've talked about tennis as a sport with with instant feedback, right? You you play a point, and you've either won it or you've lost it. There's no do overs. There's no tied points. It's not. That's not how it works, right? You play a point, you've won it or you've lost it, and approximately 20 seconds later, you have to play a new one. And that might sound, 20 seconds might sound like a lot of time, but if we if we actually think what we have to do in between points, like let's say, let's say we hit a ball into the net and we're standing a foot or two behind the baseline. We have to walk up towards the net we have to go we have to pick up that ball that takes a few seconds we have to walk back to the baseline we hopefully have to have caught our breath we hopefully have to have planned for that next point and we've talked about also what you know what that routine in between points might look like in a, in a structured way um but it's not that much time and having the presence of mind to be able to focus on the next point especially after maybe we've double faulted or maybe we've hit an unforced error in that previous point or maybe we're not playing that well maybe we we expect ourselves to play at a certain level and for whatever reason today 
we're having a tough time doing that, right? We're maybe losing to a player that we feel like we should be beating, or maybe we're getting crushed or, or it's a really close match. And, you know, we feel like we're not playing up to our capability, whatever it is, it can be very easy to get stuck on those things and and have our focus in the moment be on those things rather than on the next point. Or also rather than, you know, it, it can also be easy to, to focus on the future and focus on, okay, I, I really am just trying to, to, trying to win this match because then I have, then I get to play this next, you know, this next player who I played a few weeks ago who beat me and I know I can beat them. Um, so it can be very easy to get ahead of ourselves. Or I really want to win this match because this can impact my ranking or my UTR rating or whatever it is. So that presence that Josh Waitzkin describes, I really like it. The, the way he describes it, and there's a great quote right at the end of the chapter where he really lays that out. And, and he also has a book, um, the art, the art of learn, the art That's of right. learning. Yeah. Um, where, where where he talks about you know sort of his philosophy and how he has managed to um, really master now multiple different sports and and different activities and and really lays out a framework for for that and for learning. Um, but he talks more about you know presence and how you know just being able to embrace the situation. I know there's a there's a quote. I don't think it's by him i but it's um it's a quote that i think multiple people have used and it's it's something along the lines of you know whatever happens like i don't mind it's almost like being able to embrace the cir- whatever circumstances you end up being in to you know to to really try to gain control and really try to um yeah manage that situation as as well as possible um so yeah i, I think there's a lot that that was in that particular chapter um he also talks about within you know in terms of learning which i think is important you know trying to not you know depth over breath so trying to really dive deeply into the information really trying to to learn as much as possible about a particular thing and i know he talked about this in tai chi and we also talked about this in chess like really trying to learn end games and i think with tennis and actually i think this connects to what you were talking about earlier earlier brian you can't be a master of everything you're not going to be that incredible servant volley player that also has incredible touch that also has incredible movement that also can do everything at the highest level and if you're constantly focused on bringing you know focused on your weaknesses and bringing them up to you know, the level of your strengths, then that, then you're not going to be continuing to focus on those strengths. So, you know, if you were adept at all of those different things, you'd be number one in the world. Right. Um, but, you know, trying to instead really try to focus deep on something on a small pool of information, as he talks about, um, and being able to, to really master elements of your game, whether it's, you know, your ground strokes or your, or your touch or your volleys or serving or whatever it is, or aspects of the mental game, but trying to really dive into it rather than trying to do everything. And rather than trying to be a master of everything, understanding what you're good at and being able to really continue to, you know, continue to work on weaknesses. Sure. But also build on those strengths and really have that understanding of your game. I mean, um, I think a lot of, you know, I, I think another, important theme here is to really try to understand your own game, try to understand your, you know, your opponent's game, weaknesses, strengths, which is a lot, to me very connected with this concept of tennis IQ, which is obviously the name of the podcast, but also something in, and we've talked about this with Jorge Capistani, who has talked about his, you know, three levels of tennis IQ being, you know, that understanding of yourself, that understanding of your opponent, and then that broader understanding of the dynamics of the match itself. And I think there's a lot of overlap with some of the themes of the book of just having that understanding and being able to utilize that understanding of these three areas in order to be successful out there. Yeah. I mean, and to me, the tennis IQ three levels that Jorge Capistani talks about are, it's easier to understand those in actual combat sports in which you're interacting with the opponent because um yeah you're physically engaged with them so you're you're often at that level three focusing on the opponent um where in tennis because of the lack of physical contact and we're separated by 78 feet or so uh oftentimes it's and we stop playing 
uh, we're often focused on ourselves so back into level two. And um, this book is a real good kind of view into why we need to be at level three. Um, I like your point about the depth piece because that also supports um, you know, Anders Ericsson's research about what was what differentiates grandmasters in chess from the next level down. And it was the it was the amount of study that they did. The grandmasters studied much more than the next level down. And then that next level down studied and practiced more than the previous level, right? And so it's really a function of that wanting to go deep on some things. And when we look at top professionals, they're not completely well-rounded. And in some of them, they're, they're, they are just have a couple of shots. Now, granted, you know, we've mentioned this before. Howard Bryant mentioned this when we had him on the, on the show. Um, John Isner, serve him forehand. That's it. And he's very successful because he understands that's his game. And he's not necessarily changing that for anybody because he's made those things so good that they're difficult to deal with, no matter who you are. And he has wins over some of the greatest players in history because of his focus on those two shots and and being very clear about his game. So we want to make sure we're doing that with ourselves because I think, and I've been talking to a few players recently about this, Josh, is that in some respects, I think we as tennis players have this sort of notion of what an ideal tennis player is. A big serve, a big forehand, big ground strokes, beautiful form, and so forth. And for some of us, that can be uh, limiting because we're not going to be that way. You know, one of the people I was talking to today, she's like 5'1", if, maybe, right? like maybe not even. And she's talking about having a bigger serve. And I'm like, I'm not sure that's the right thing. <laughs> you're 5'1". You're somewhat vertically challenged to create this big serve. You know, and she's playing at the top level of her league. You know, it's a 4-5 plus league. Um, unless you're going to be able to get that around 110, I'm not sure having a big serve is, is the thing. Maybe it's you should work on that slice serve, keeping it lower. Or working on your kick serve so you're getting it up around shoulder height. Um, and she actually is good at those two serves, but she feels bad that she doesn't have this big serve. And I'm like, no, right? That's where this sort of archetypal tennis player thing is getting in the way. Like, you don't need that. That's not you. You know, at, with your game and who you are physically, the slice serve low and a kick serve high, it's exactly what you should be hitting. Those are the sh- shots you should embrace as part of you, right? And I think the more that we understand how these things affect the opponent, like, you know, her developing a big serve, what's that going to do? It's just going to sit in somebody's strike zone. And you, know, you, you show players that serve enough times, they're going to smack it back at you, right? Should she have a flat serve every now and then as a mix-up? Sure. But, you know, when you're, uh, when you're serving, you should really be looking to make the contact point for the returner difficult. You you don't want to be feeding it to where they're at waist height and they only have to take maybe one step or no steps. You want that ball to get either wide, high, low. Um, and so a lot of your serves should be designed in that manner. So if you're not John Isner, you need to figure out how do I get these, you know, how do I hit these suboptimal contact points for my for the returner, right? So that's why you know, I may have kind of gone off there on a tangent, but this idea I think that we often have, Josh, around there's a there's like this typical great tennis player that actually might be limiting our abilities to go deeper into who we are and how we play the game. Brad Gilbert's a great example of someone who doesn't fit the archetype and was okay with that. And there have been many players like that over the years. And I think the more that everybody understands themselves a little bit more, then it's about, all right, now I know how I fight. This is my fight. This is the fight I want to have with you. Don't want to fight on somebody else's terms where you're trying to hit big shots all the time. That just might not be you, right? Um, I would highly recommend to people not only read this book and this chapter on Josh, but getting his book. Um, 
The Art of Learning. And he also did some really great interview episodes with Tim Ferriss on his podcast. They were years ago, I want to say, probably several years ago now, but um, some really long form, good, good conversations. Uh, there are at least two, maybe three episodes that he did with Tim Ferriss that were totally worth listening to. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought up um, Brad Gilbert and sort of bringing playing the match on your own terms. I remember when he when he talked about um, starting to work with Andre Agassi in that book. And Agassi, as I'm sure most of our listeners are aware, had, you know, it, it was full of game, right? And, and obviously had a lot of, put in his 10,000 hours, probably by a very young age, just, it, you know, in the ball machine, ball, ball machines, um, at, at the, you know, it is the tennis court in his house that his dad had constructed and everything. Um, but what was interesting was Brad Gilbert was talking about how Andre Agassi would often try to beat people at their game. And if somebody had, let's say, a really strong forehand and they were trying to go forehand to forehand, uh, Agassi would, would say, OK, I can I can beat you with that. I can beat you forehand to forehand and or if it's their backhand, you know, and, and beat beat somebody that way. And the, the the message that that Brad was really trying to get across was that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to play perfectly. You don't have to always be, you know, hitting these fantastic shots every single time, trying to beat people at their own game. Sometimes it's about, you know, manipulating their their weaknesses, being able to use your own strengths to the opponent's weaknesses as often as possible. You know, that to me, that is what high percentage, that's a big piece of what high percentage tennis is. Really knowing your own game, knowing, okay, these are my strengths. These are my patterns that I really, you know, I know I'm successful with. I know I've used them time and time again. And I am able to identify how I can best use those patterns against my opponent's game, where I don't have to, going back to our the earlier point in our conversation, I don't have to serve and volley and drop shot lob and use the slice and, you know, bring my opponent from side to side to side to side. To side. Um, I can pick whatever I'm best at and, use that to manipulate my opponent and, and, you know, use my strengths. And, you know, if I'm not good at that drop shot lob combo, then I shouldn't try to be using it. Right. Carlos Alcaraz, who I know we've talked about a lot in this podcast, who's, you know, going to end the year as the ATP number one, youngest ever ATP number one, um, is phenomenal at the drop shot. He should use it a lot. For, I would say for many players, maybe even most players, the drop shot can be a relative, can be a pretty low percentage play. I think before I watched him, I was under the impression that universally it was a pretty low percentage place. Can some people do it really well? Yes. Should they use it a lot? Sure. Um, but it's, it's still a relatively risky play. You might hit the ball into the net, right? Where you lose the point automatically. You might hit the ball a little, sh- a little bit long where you're just essentially setting up your opponent to to crush it and really take control of the point right so if it, it it's it's a tough shot so it's you know it, i think we can go back to what we were talking about earlier and you don't have to do it all i also am not somebody that's serving volleys too often i i don't have the, the world's best volleys so i you know i i'll mix it in every once in a while maybe a 40 40 love point or something like that to try to you know finish finish off a, a game but I'm not going to try to rely on that. So it's, I think the point is that we don't have to do it all. We have to really have that clear understanding of ourselves, our opponents, and, you know, really try to understand, okay, with, with that all in mind, you know, what are those patterns? What, what do we need to actually do to be successful? And it's probably not just, you know, digging into what the opponent wants to do and saying, I can do one better. But maybe it is that sabotage. Maybe it is manipulating the situation a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that's a good, good deep dive there, Josh, into you know understanding again your game and and how to use that against opponents. Um, let's switch gears now to another chapter. I know that we wanted to get to, which was um, yep. the first chapter of the book which is about a wrestling legend named uh, Dan Gable. The title of the chapter is Fire and Brimstone. Um, 
And I don't think, I think this was the perfect opening chapter for this book. Um, for those of you who don't know who Dan Gable is, just a remarkable wrestler and also was a highly decorated coach uh, at the University of Iowa. Um, really, I think maybe one loss in his entire career, and that was when he was leading in uh, the NCAA finals, I believe. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, his, his record in high school and college was 183 and one. Um, he won the gold medal at the 72 Olympics without getting a single point scored against him. Uh, so just real utter dominance. And when you read the chapter, you feel like you're reading about the human embodiment of intensity. Yeah. So that's why I thought the it was a great opening chapter, especially from a tennis player's perspective. It's like, wow, what if, what if we could bring this same level of intensity to the tennis court? What would happen? This same level of focus about, you know, and this is really where I had first read the concept out loud about breaking the opponent mentally. There's one other person in this book who also mentioned that exact same thing. And it also happened to be someone who was a college wrestler, Randy Couture, probably more famous in North America because of his career in, um, in MMA. But yeah, before that, he was a, a great college wrestler at Oklahoma State. So he talked about that. And they, they both mentioned that, that breaking somebody was the pinnacle of this whole thing. And that's where I remember reading about like, wow, that's, that's, that's fascinating. And I just want to read that part um, from the Gable chapter because I think we've discussed that many times, Josh. And um, I think it's important to understand that again, at a deeper level. This is why you you have your game. This is why you understand your game because you want to use your game as a way to put pressure on the opponent so that you can break them mentally. David Samuel, would, you know, he, he called that making the opponent mentally uncomfortable. Well, we make them um, mentally uncomfortable so we can break them. All right, so um, so here's, here's the part I wanted to read. It said, breaking somebody is the goal. You get him to quit trying to win. He tries to survive. It's there a lot, meaning the opportunity. But often people don't see it. You have to have done it quite a few times or you'll miss the key point because he can come back. Once he shows signs of breaking, if you don't take advantage, there's a chance of him coming back. So keep pressure on at all times. To me, that's just such a great message to tennis players because you and I can watch a match, Josh, and we can see that one player is in a position maybe to really assert their dominance. But what do they do? Maybe they make a couple of dumb mistakes. They lose focus. Um, They let the opponent back in with maybe their negative reactions or those giving away free points. And instead, where they could have just kept the pressure on, keep doing what you're doing, hammer away at that weakness, they're they're going to crack. If you let them, if you continue to put it, put that pressure on. So it's almost like you have your opponent on the ground, your foot on their chest. Do you let them up by making some mistakes and losing focus? Or do you put them away once you have them there? And, and that's what Gable is talking about. Understanding what those signs of breaking are, recognizing them, and then keeping applying the pressure. And how do you apply pressure? You know your game. You have a lot of clarity about how you play the game and how you pressure opponents, whether that's through consistency, accuracy, directionals, spin, power, taking time away from the opponent. Know the ways that you're good at putting pressure on, and then you keep doing that to the opponent. And what you'll see is, as he says here, that the opponent will quit trying to win. They'll simply try to survive what's going on out there. Um, They'll begin to make excuses to themselves, maybe out loud. The effort level will go down. They'll start trying to hit shots that they really can't hit. They'll start trying to end points when you know that they won't be able to do that. They won't be able to hit enough winners to beat you. And so they'll make more mistakes. 
simply by you sticking to your game and putting pressure on these opponents, you'll get them to lose. And that, yep. in a way, is one of the one of the ways you earn wins. Totally, totally. And I think you know he talks about this concept of really trying to build on your lead, yeah. right? Not coasting to victory, continuing to build on a lead. And I think you know we were just talking about Brad Gilbert, but he talks about not changing a winning game plan, right? I think a lot of people have this idea that if if something's working that maybe their opponent is going to start figuring them out. Oh, the, you know, this has been working. Okay, I, my opponent is just, I, I have to change something up so that my opponent doesn't figure me out so that I'm not too predictable. But in reality, if it's working, you should probably keep at it. Um, and yeah, he talks about keeping that intensity up, building on that lead, not coasting to victory. I, I remember he he talked about his one loss, right? What, what did you say, Brian? 183 and one, something yeah. like that? Yeah. Be- between, um, and, and that, that one was a situation where he was ahead and he talks about how he, you know, he was coasting and, and he slipped. And, you know, because of that, you know, he, he lost the lead and, and ultimately lost the match. And I think, you know, you, we, we've we've all probably seen it in tennis where we get to a point where the opponent has broken mentally. We might call that tanking. We might, you know, refer to that in, in different ways. But, you know, I think many of us have probably been there. Many of us have probably seen it, certainly. Um, but if you get to a point where the opponent feels frustrated, they don't. They, they they don't feel like they can play their game. They feel like they've tried everything and nothing's working. They might give up they might look for an excuse as you said maybe it's the strings maybe it's the racket the wind the line calls something um and give in and that only happens if you keep that pressure up right if you're playing a certain way and you have you're about to serve for the match and you just say okay i can i don't have to keep up that same level of intensity that same level of pressure that i've been putting on the opponent that's been leading to these results um you know, and, and you take the foot off the gas a little bit, that's often when the opponent can come back and can start to turn things around. Um, and then once you lose that momentum, it can be tough to to reclaim it. Um, so I, I really like that in terms of that intensity, in terms of really building on leads, not just coasting in that moment. And also his work ethic. I mean, I, they talked a little bit about his work ethic, how he would work out, you know, multiple times a day, how he, that, that work ethic that he had was really legendary. And he, it just seemed like he applied that, you know, being extreme to just every to about just every area of his life, whether that's his working out, whether that's his just studying the, you know, opponents, whether that um, could be applied to his coaching as well. He became a top, top coach after his um after his career. So uh, I think, yeah, you know, I, I, I did really like that they started the book with this particular chapter because I think it, it shows what's possible in terms of, you know, your limits, right. That we all often think of, you know, certain limits that they can't be broken. Oh, you know, how much can I really work out? How much do I really want to work out? And he showed that there is another, another level and another level. And then he's probably a few levels past that in terms of just working out a, a crazy amount. And and they even brought up the four minute mile and this, this um, sort of this fabled, you know, story about Roger Bannister, how nobody thought for, for years and years and years that the human body could break the four minute mile. And then after Roger Bannister broke it, you know, dozens of people broke it shortly after because it showed what was possible. It showed what was possible. And, you know, I think the same thing can be said, you know, in, in anything, right? In, in tennis and in, in other areas of life where if we don't think that something is possible, that we're probably right. It's not going to be possible for, for us in that situation. But, you know, having that self-belief, knowing that you can do it, knowing that there probably is another level in terms of work ethic, in terms of discipline, in terms of professionalism, in terms of some of these areas makes it possible to achieve those new heights. Yeah, right. So understanding there's also new levels of performance out there. When you're the best in the world, it's not a time to relax. And yep. you know, we've seen this with tennis players. That the guys who get to number one, they don't relax. They have to keep going because they know people behind them are now – they're shooting for them. 
So we, they have to get better. And you look at all the number ones that we've had over the last 20 years or so, and they've all improved their games over the course of their careers. And so, yeah, uh, Dan Gable took it to you know another level. Um, I think it's also reminiscent of a more recent athlete, you know, Kobe Bryant, who's um, famous for these midnight workouts or 4.30 a.m. workouts. You know, for those of you who are um, interested in, in basketball, the uh, there's a documentary on Netflix called The Redeem Team. I don't know if you've seen that yet, Josh, but it's all about the 2008 men's U.S. men's Olympic basketball team and how they had not done very well in 2004. And it's about the process of, I guess, redemption for them. And there's this story of when they brought Kobe Bryant into the team, I think in the last year of that, like 2007, uh, that they were having training camp in Las Vegas. And there was one night that, you know, the team wanted to go out, celebrate some things. They went out to dinner, they went to some clubs, and they're coming back around 4.30 in the morning. And who do they see in the lobby is Kobe Bryant going to the gym. And it was a real eye-opening thing for the rest of the team. And it really just changed the tenor of how they approached what they were going to do. So guys started going to the gym early uh, with Kobe. Not all of them, (laughs) but they, they started working out more. And they were taking things very, very seriously. And um, the documentary, you know, if you like basketball, it's worth watching. Um, Even if you're just a fan of excellence and how to produce that and so forth, it's it's worth watching. Um, But, you know, Kobe reminds me of Dan Gable. You know, Dan Gable is probably the original. Many players have kind of copied that since then. Um, But, yeah, this idea of there's always, always another level for you. You're never done. That's the great thing about tennis. That's the great thing about mastery is that there's always something to shoot for. It's not like you're in some sort of video game and you reach the top level and the game's over. There's more. There's more work to do. And I think um, this chapter is just a fantastic introduction to that to that concept of, um, of hard work, intensity, um, and, and essentially fighting with purpose. Totally. Totally. Yeah. He talks about, you know, there not being a limit to performance. You can always add to it. And um, yeah, I think, you know, we all need to think about what separates us from, from our opponents. Is it that work ethic? Is it the mental toughness? Is it our footwork and our speed around the court, right? Is it some combination of things? And what is going to be the difference maker ultimately? Cause everybody's working hard. Everybody has game you know, everybody wants to win, every, you know, everyone's competitive. So what do you have? What is that X factor for maybe for somebody like a Dan Gable or a Kobe Bryant? It's those countless hours that they're, that they're putting in, right? Maybe for someone else, it's, it's, it's a different area of their game that they're really trying to excel at that really can be that X factor, that difference maker. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that, that's one of the things that I thought about. Um, even going back to Andre Agassi, right? His dad, and I think there's a lot of, you know, tennis parents like this probably, but, but viewed it as, okay, my, you know, Andre is going to hit millions of tennis balls. Right. Um, and that is going to be the difference maker between him and all the other kids, his age. And then ultimately all the other players in the world, that are all trying to fight for these same titles and these same rankings. And yeah, I, th- I think people can apply that to their own games. Not that they're going to be you know, necessarily working out like a Dan Gable or a Kobe Bryant, but what, what can you do that maybe other, other, you know, if you're a three, five player, what can you do that other three, five players aren't doing right? Maybe, maybe it's how you handle pressure and really coming up with a good plan for how you do that. Maybe it's your strength and conditioning, right? And maybe it's taking that to the next level or your serving and and your consistency there on the first serve. Um, We've talked about how, you know, at the pro level, there, there's a big difference generally between the amount of first serves made at the pro level and the amount of first serves made at all other levels. And that's not just because pros are better at it, but there, it's also decision making to a certain extent. So trying to figure out what is that X factor, what can you do that that can ultimately help you be the best fighter, the best competitor that you can be um, and help you be successful. Just And I, and I again, would 
you know, definitely highlight this book. Definitely would recommend it. And I think there's a lot of great examples of different competitors from all different walks of life, different places around the world, different um, sports, and and how they have, you know, how their mindset, how their intensity, their dedication, their discipline, all of these things have helped them really dominate their their respective sports. And I think the thing I would leave the listeners with is, can you bring more intensity to the fight part of the sport? Um, be more engaged with that. Think of this as a fight. Go out there. And that doesn't mean, you know, act unethically and act like a jerk or anything like that. But can you be more intense about the one-on-one or two-on-two combat and understand um, it's not about judging yourself and beating yourself up. It's about how you're engaging in the fight with the opponent and enjoying that aspect of it. That's what it is. If you can enjoy that aspect of tennis more than your opponents, you give yourself a natural advantage because then you're also being a realist because that is, that, that's the nature of the sport. And if you can embrace it, enjoy that, yeah, there are going to be times where you know, they're, they're winning points or you're basically taking punches. That's part of the process. But in the end, can you enjoy the fact that you got through it, proud of the way you competed, you were a fighter, you stayed intense the whole time, you stayed focused on pressuring the opponent the whole time, and and didn't beat yourself up, you'd be very proud at the end of a match, I think. So, well, Josh, that was a cool discussion. We probably could have gone into like a lot more on this book, but I think that was a, a good start. Maybe we'll revisit some other chapters in the future. Um, Part two. Yeah, exactly. Um, But thanks to everyone for listening. Uh, For more on today's episode, please check out the show notes. If you have any feedback or questions for me and Josh, please email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. You can also use the Twitter hashtag tennisiq. Additionally, please subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice, including YouTube, so you can be notified of new episodes. You can also check us out on Instagram. If you would like to support the podcast, please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash tennis IQ slash membership. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you soon in our next episode.